In early August of 1415, a vast Portuguese armada approached the coast of North Africa near the Strait of Gibraltar. Its primary objective, the city of Sayuta, came into view. The fleet consisted of 59 galleys, 33 caracks, and 120 support vessels. On board were 20,000 troops with an additional 30,000 support personnel. The force was multinational, consisting of not only Portuguese men, but also recruits and mercenaries from France, England, and Germany. Years of meticulous planning went into this attack, which was arranged in the utmost of secrecy. The invasion force was led by the warrior King John I of Portugal, and by his side were his three sons, including his heir, Prince Edward. Sayuta was a fabulously wealthy city, a place where the trade routes of North Africa ended, and it was extremely strategic being well-placed on the Strait of Gibraltar. As such, its defenses were impressive. Over the centuries, it had been built into a fortress, defended by high walls and impressive towers. The Marinid dynasty, the current owners, had even gone so far as to add an imposing citadel. The Portuguese arrived with their fleet on August 12, 1415. As they entered the harbor, they immediately came under bombardment from the city. This initially prevented the Europeans from making landfall. Meanwhile, the governor of the city, Salah bin Salah, ordered the women and children to depart and brought in as many reinforcements as he could find. However, the Marinid Sultan, Abu Sayyad Uthman III of Fez, due to massive internal upheaval that bordered on civil war, was unable to send in any further troops. King John of Portugal managed to reorganize his men for an attack on August 16th, but that very night, a strong gale descended on the fleet, which literally scattered it to the wind. The next morning, with the Portuguese fleet absent, the defenders of the city came to the conclusion that the Europeans had given up. The governor, Salah bin Salah, made the decision to release his reinforcements, leaving only a small garrison, a decision he'd soon regret. It was on August 21st, 1415, that King John returned in force once again. Against the odds, he had brought his fleet together and his soldiers were eager for battle. As before, the fleet sailed into the harbor. Landing craft that were loaded with troops were lowered into the water and then quickly made their way to the beaches. However, as the king was making his way to the shore, he was shot and wounded in the leg. His men began to falter. It was at this point that his son, a man by the name of Prince Henry, took up the royal standard and led the attack onwards. Flanked by his brother, Prince Edward, the heir to the throne, and supported by 300 men, Henry advanced to the Al Medina Gate, which was poorly defended. Due to the speed of Henry's attack, the gate was not properly secured and was soon smashed open. A massive breach would follow as King John arrived at the gate with the rest of the army. The Portuguese poured into the city and brushed aside the defenders. This small, outnumbered garrison was able to resist fiercely at first, but eventually they had to break and run. Salah bin Salah retreated to his citadel, but he remained there only for a night. It was during that night that he realized that his options were very limited. He decided to use the cover of darkness and fled the city as well. The very next day, all resistance in Sayuta came to an end, at which point the flag of Lisbon was hoisted above the battlements of the city. The Portuguese Empire had begun. By the late 14th century, Portugal was a relatively impoverished nation. When King John came to power on April 6, 1385, he inherited a kingdom that seemed to have a relatively dismal future. The kingdoms of Central Europe, on the other hand, were growing as the Renaissance in certain areas was beginning. The city-states of Italy, especially Genoa and Venice, which had a monopoly on trade to the Orient, were growing immensely wealthy. As can be imagined, this was envied by just about everybody else. Portugal, meanwhile, was missing out. It was on the extreme periphery. As the writer John Crowley would say, it was the prow of Europe. 
The kingdom had a long coastal border that looked on towards a menacing, seemingly endless Atlantic Ocean. An ocean, by the way, that the Arabs would call the Green Sea of Darkness. To the east, Portugal was blocked by its powerful and aggressive neighbor Castile. Indeed, a few months after King John had come to power, Castile invaded with a strong army. At the Battle of Aljubarata on August 14, 1485, the Portuguese king, despite being outnumbered by nearly 5 to 1, achieved a decisive victory. His position as a sovereign was secured, and the House of Aviz, which he founded, would last for nearly 200 years. In the aftermath of this battle, King John was able to focus on the task of expanding his realm. Thirty years later, he and his sons stood as conquerors of the city of Ceuta. Roger Crowley in the book Conquerors describes this moment well. Quote, the Portuguese had come to wash their hands in infidel blood. They fulfilled their contract to the letter. Three days of pillage and massacre then ransacked a place once described as the flower of all other cities in Africa, its gateway and its key. This stunning coup served notice to European rivals that this small kingdom was self-confident, energetic, and on the move. End quote. On August 24, 1415, in what had once been the city's mosque, now converted into a church known as Our Lady of Africa, a rightfully proud King John knighted his sons. Prince Henry's moment had finally come. The prince, who would be known to history as Henry the Navigator, looked at the city of Sayuta and saw a vast, untapped potential. In his mind, he saw North African caravans bringing in the spices from the east. He glimpsed the Trans-Saharan trade routes, bringing in the legendary gold of Mount Samusa. Henry didn't have to look much further than the Catalan Atlas of 1375 to reaffirm his beliefs. There, he would see the mighty African king holding up a gold coin in his hand, sitting near the fabled river of gold. Mansa Musa's famous pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324, where he brought so much gold that it devalued its worth, obviously had an effect on the European mind. But the knighted prince, not just a warrior, but also a man with a talent for seizing opportunity, saw much more. He observed a way of cutting out the middlemen of Genoa and Venice, and getting directly to the spice markets of Alexandria and Damascus. He saw an ability to outflank the growth of Islam. Indeed, his later ventures of exploration would be billed to the Pope as crusades. What's more, he believed that by exploring Africa, a way could be found to reach Prester John. Prester John was believed to be an extremely powerful Christian king who had a vast empire someplace to the east. His tale emerged in the 12th and 13th centuries as the Crusades were being pushed back by Islam. The belief was that if Europe could only reach Prester John, then perhaps he would unleash his armies and destroy the Caliphate in a combined attack. Prince Henry's mind was made up. Portugal would have to expand, and thus it would need to explore, or face a slow death of obscurity. For Henry, Sayuta was just the beginning. It was a city that needed to be a firm part of Portugal's domain. When his father, King John, placed him in charge of Sayuta's defense, he took the job extremely seriously. Thus, four years later, in 1419, when the Marinid Sultan Abu Sayyad Uthman III launched a major attack on the city, Henry quickly sailed his fleet to alleviate the Muslim siege. But by the time he arrived, the commander of his garrison had daringly sallied forth and destroyed the besiegers. The Muslims were forced to fall back, and the Sultan Uthman was later assassinated in Fez in 1420 for his failure. The Marinid Sultanate would descend into anarchy, and Sayuta would face little opposition in the coming years. Prince Henry, on the other hand, got the credit for the win. On May 25, 1420, he was appointed the Grand Master of the Order of Christ. This was a religious organization that was considered the successor to the now dissolved Knights Templar. The position brought him a lot of prestige, and a steady source of income that he was more than eager to use. Henry was now set to further his ambitions. In the city of Sagres, located in the southernmost part of Portugal, he was renowned as establishing his famous school of navigation. 
Now, it needs to be mentioned that there was not much evidence that Henry actually built a physical school. The truth of the matter is that he probably just brought together cartographers, sea captains, sailors, pilots, men that were willing to explore and compile their information, and the prince provided a platform, likely just a collection of buildings that he owned for these men to congregate and to engage in discourse. Either way, more detailed maps were created, sailing tools like the compass and the astrolabe were better utilized than studied, and as a result, the Portuguese began to take a commanding lead on venturing into the unknown. Henry also made an important decision that would forever affect maritime history. He simply wanted a better ship. The answer that he and his team came up with was known as the Caravel. The Caravel was based on a Portuguese fishing vessel weighing approximately 80 tons with a shallow draft, which made it ideal for exploring estuaries and coastal waters. However, its design also functioned very well on the open ocean, which thus far had been a major obstacle. Triangular sails, possibly of Arab origin, known as Latin sails, allowed it to sail against the wind, albeit in a zigzag pattern. It also had two or three masts, some of which were rigged with square sails in order to give it better speed. The rudder was expanded for greater maneuverability, and a forecastle and a stern castle were incorporated, giving the ship a better defensive edge. It didn't require a large crew, which allowed for longer voyages. Most importantly, the ship could not only sail out, but it could also return in relative safety. Therefore, the design became an astounding success, and later variants of the Caravel would be larger, better equipped, and have heavier weaponry. The stage for exploration was now set. In 1419, Henry sponsored a voyage to Africa which got blown off course, but inadvertently discovered the Madeira Archipelago, located approximately 250 miles west off the coast of Morocco. Henry's men landed on one of the islands and established a new colony which would be named Porto Santo. The islands of the Madeira Archipelago would be a blessing to the expansion of Portugal. It would serve as the base of operations and a stepping stone to new discoveries. What's more, the island served as a vast source of timber, perfect for ship construction. Madeira, by the way, in Portuguese, means wood. Prince Henry also saw here an opportunity to create a plantation system to grow crops, like sugarcane. This endeavor would be vastly successful, and 80 years later, more sugar was produced on these islands than any other place in the world. This plantation system would later be reinforced with fortified trading outposts known as fetorias, roughly translated factories. Fetorias and plantations would prove another major success. In fact, in time, they'd be set up in most of the lands that Portugal would eventually claim. The discoveries would continue. Later in 1439, the Azores were colonized and incorporated into the empire. These islands would also serve as a base of operations and a springboard for further exploration. However, for Henry, his main goal was always pushing south along the west coast of Africa. Roger Crowley again in Conquerors explains, quote, Henry, the navigator, continued to sponsor expeditions down the coast of Africa in search of slaves, gold, and spices. Year by year, headland by headland, Portuguese ships worked their way down the southwestward sloping bulge of West Africa, cautiously sounding with plumb lines as they went, forever wary of shoals and reefs, over which the sea broke in pounding surf. In the process, they began to delineate the shape of a continent the desert coasts of Mauritania, the lush tropical shores of the region they called Guinea, and the great rivers of equatorial Africa, the Senegal, and the Gambia. Under Henry's direction, exploration, raiding, and trading went hand in hand with ethnographical curiosity and mapping." End quote. Henry's explorers continued to push the boundary of the known world. As they made their way, they put up large stone pillars that had crosses on top, known as padraos, which would serve as markers. 
Later, outposts and trading stations were also established. Gold was found and shipped back. While it wasn't a massive haul, it was enough for the Portuguese crown to start minting gold coins known as cruzado. It was also during these expeditions that the slave trade would also begin to ramp up. By 1444, 240 slaves were brought back and paraded for sale in the harbor of Lisbon. In the next 15 years, another 20,000 slaves, men, women, and children, would be brought back as well. This would establish the beginning of the slave trade that would persist for more than 300 years. Make no mistake, this would make Portugal rich, but it would have devastating effects on the economy of Africa. In all, Henry funded over 14 expeditions. Not all of them would be successful, but those that did return would bring back not just potential for more trading opportunities, but also invaluable information on the tides, the currents, the local wildlife, the winds, and the people, which were all compiled together and guarded with extreme secrecy. Eventually, even the infamous Cape Boja door was overcome. Before Prince Henry, this cape was a major obstacle on account of its harsh winds and strong currents. It was said that beyond were waters that could boil a man alive and sea monsters of ever increasing magnitude. After Prince Henry, this cape was only a marker that was passed by as Portugal continued to extend further and further south along the African coast. However, not everything that Henry the Navigator did was successful. He was defeated by Castile when he attempted to take the Canary Islands, and in 1437 he attempted to take Tangiers in Morocco, as the North African trade routes had been diverted away from Sayuta to the city. It turned out to be a complete disaster. Tangiers was too well defended. Portugal didn't have enough troops or siege equipment, and eventually the entire Portuguese army got trapped there. Henry was forced to trade in his own brother, Ferdinand, as a hostage to allow for the Portuguese forces to retreat in peace. The prince was also obliged to hand over Sayuta, which he refused to do, and his brother would eventually die in a Muslim prison. Despite his failures, Prince Henry the Navigator had set a powerful precedence for his country. While he wasn't an explorer himself per se, he definitively got the ball rolling. Those that would follow in his footsteps would continue to explore, create maps, design better ships, find new trade routes, not to mention, frankly, exploiting the rapidly expanding world around them for personal gain and glory. Portugal, as a result of his actions, would take an early lead in the Age of Discovery. While it never had the manpower to have a big land empire, it did have the motivation and the cunning to be a serious trade empire. In 1460, Henry died. He was interred in the Batalha Monastery in central Portugal. In retrospect, the prince would be regarded as one of the founding fathers of Portugal's empire, but he would also be a major figure in maritime history in general. His contribution, after all, could not be overlooked. 26 years after his death, the word Descobramento would appear in written form in Portuguese for the first time in recorded history. When translated into English, this word meant discovery. <laughs> <laughs>